Hi everyone. Um, so as many of you uh, certainly know, the, the study of the S matrix of scattering amplitude uh, has been always very important at the APHT since uh, the very beginning. I think uh, even before, even when it was a uh, uh, service de physique mathematique. And uh, well, this was uh, at the time, uh, these people were working around the 60s and 70s. I will uh, uh, discuss about uh, their work. And uh, one of the purpose of this talk is to show you that the legacy about uh, the bulk of this uh, work in the 60s and 70s still carries on today in different form, in different uh, also goals, and by different people. But uh, still there is a connection. Uh, and also this connection is very important for my own research. But if I, I will have time, I will try to highlight. OK, so the S matrix, I'm not sure if everybody knows what we are talking about here, about S matrix. So I have a, pic, a small introduction about the subject. Uh, you know, uh, the word is quantum mechanical. And in quantum mechanics, we don't predict with certainty the outcome of experiments. Okay? What we can only predict with certainty are amplitudes or probabilities for things to happen. Even though you know the system very well, your uh, uh, called initial state, you know it very well, the outcome of, the, of, the, of your measurements is not predictable. What you can predict are probabilities for things to happen, and you can form tables of the sort where you list uh, on the rows here your initial state, your possible initial state, your, on the columns, a possible outcome that you can get, and you fill this matrix with probabilities, and uh, either by doing experiments, just you measure them, or by having a theory that predicts uh, those quantities, then comparing against data. And we're talking, so you, you see, it's a sort of a table, it's a sort of a matrix that justifies the name here, matrix. And the S comes because we're talking about scattering. You know, scattering means that you are preparing particular class of states are states that uh, very early on in time look like a separate collections of particles that don't talk much to each other. They are pretty much free because they are separated in clusters and the interactions are not long range or sufficiently weak. Uh, you can neglect the interaction on them. That's your initial state. And you can ask yourself, with any given such a state, what is the probability to find a different set of particles in the far future, the out state here, where this particle may have changed different type, different flavor, different scattering angles, and so on and so forth. And what people uh, uh, have considered is this uh, big matrix for uh, incoming particles and outgoing particles called the S matrix. It's typically not written in this form here, but rather in this funny uh, uh, stuck in this, in this funny form here, where the initial state, uh, I can add a third point, perhaps. <laughs> so the initial state here, ah, they are gone. And uh, another one is the output state. And you can actually think of these as matrix elements of an operator, this matrix operator. They evolve you from the infinite past to the infinite future. Now. Since from very far, everything looks like a particle, including <laughs> physicists, right? So what is the probability? This is a question for the audience. So let's say that if we pass here is the 60s and 70s, and you prepare your initial state as a collection of amazing physicists, what is the probability that this uh, state has evolved in the future, which is about uh, with a certain, you know, we are physicists, we have approximations. Here are the time scale is an accuracy of 10 years. So as I evolved as today within 10 years accuracy to this other bunch of people. So what is, what is the, we can, there's an approximation scale for which you can do this calculation here now. What is this probability? It's one or one minus epsilon. Why is one? Well, because it's a very semi-classical system and we know that quantum mechanics is very well approximated by classical physics when you have people, for example. We are talking about people rather than elementary particles. Now, the problem 
that these people here were addressing in the past was that they did not have an approximation scheme of the sort to address the strong dynamics. It was the big problem at the time. So quantum field theory at the time was very successful for QED, where you have a small coupling constant, and you organize your calculation in, uh, for example, Feynman diagrams in perturbative expansions. And strong interactions were um, basically the interaction that uh, keep together uh, um, nuclei and uh, are the interactions between uh, uh, gluons and quarks. And they do not have such a small parameter, at least at low energy, where uh, these people at the time were stuck. But it's a low energy experiment. And there were two reactions to this difficulty. One was um, to go back to the fundamentals, to go back to the basic, the foundations of quantum field theory. And this was the school, for example, uh, in uh, Princeton. And people thought about um, going really back to the principles they hide behind uh, quantum field theory. Perhaps they will uh, lead us to, to do calculations uh, beyond perturbation theory. At the same time, there was another school uh, in the same years which said, OK, let's forget about fields, about local observables. Let's discuss instead about what is actually measured at the experiments, which are these uh, measurement done asymptotic times. Let's focus directly on asymmetric elements. And this was, for example, the school in Berkeley, as was already mentioned uh, this morning by Brison. And the strength, I really think that was really strength of the EPHT, where this core were both present at the EPHT. And uh, I think the, the important result that the S-metrics achieved uh, have survived because of this, because they were being englobed, become part of the knowledge of, of quantum field theory. And uh, this was, as I said, so, okay, this doesn't really work. OK, I have to point here. So is, um, it was the story about uh, pure S metrics. It was a story about the 60s and 70s. And then the focus uh, shifted quite rapidly uh, with advent, with the rebirth of quantum field theory with various discoveries, very important discoveries, like asymptotic freedom. So you can tackle this problem. For example, strong interactions going to high momentum transfer. And the uh, Feynman diagrams were back in business. or you discovered gauge, gauge theories could describe, you know, also massive spin one gauge bosons through spontaneous symmetry breaking. The theory was normalizable, where also string theory was discovered. Uh, the standard model uh, was coming to place. Amazing experiments also. All this brought a new momentum in a new direction, and this became a little bit uh, 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 dormant. Okay, now there's a new wave of interest at the PhD that they take started in the 90s, and uh, it is still going on, but it is a different one than the original, or at least uh, is much more focused on, on, on gauge theories, on standard model, and on uh, calculations in gravity, rather than as an alternative uh, fun formulation of, of fundamental physics. So I decided to have a little game. So to see if you, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, so we're talking about people here that uh, lived in the 60s and 70s, and uh, ma many of you perhaps don't know them. So I decided it's an uh, educational game here that I want to propose, which is I, I show you a picture and a ear, and you have to tell me who is the person and uh, what achievement uh, he, he, he made in that year. For example, this one is an easy one. I, I would say that. So I, let's start with the easy one. Well, achievements without bounds. <laughs> so who's the person? Frossard. And of course, uh, he, he discovered the Frossard bound. So this was even before the Service Physique the Theorique. That was at the time of uh, uh, the Service the Physique Mathematique. And of course, this is an important result, very important result, that also was put on firmer grounds later by uh, André Martin. 
and uh, uh, is essentially uh, an asymptotic upper bound on the growth of scattering amplitudes a fixed uh, uh, energy momentum transfer. And it plays actually a role today, for example, in my own research, this result, in the study of effective theories. Now, there's a funny thing about Frasal that I want to share here. I did, well, I was preparing this talk, all pictures I could find, is, you see, he's always wearing a nice papillon. I think also all f pictures outside there, you can see it. So I think this reflects a little bit the spirit of the time. I think uh, it was actually pretty cool. Uh, I was wondering whether to come today with a, with a nice papillon, then I didn't feel it about it, but uh, I think it's uh, really nice. It's a nice picture by Frossard in 63 on the Lake of Como in a conference. And in the same picture, you can see also the results of OBCs uh, uh, appearing. I, although it, lo it looks like Schrodinger here, but... So who is this one instead? Good, okay. So maybe I should add a constraint. People which are uh, older than 60 should not add, try to answer. No, I jo <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, I was Michelle, which is younger. No, no, it was a joke, it was a joke. Um, yes, oops, was uh, uh, ja Jacob, and uh, his contribution was basically with uh, Giancarlo Wick, introduced elicity amplitudes, and uh, for example, the partial wave expansion for any particle in spin, it's a way to project on uh, reps, uh, systems with more, more, more particles. So this one already, I uh, heard already the answer. Who said it, you? Jacques Bros, yes. So this is Jacques Bros. And what was his contribution, 63? Uh, I think the, the, the extension of an LBC property of the scattering amplitude. Yes, indeed. So of the, for the, essentially for the four points. Exactly. So With uh, Epstein and Glaser. It was they did a very big one. Yes. It was the discovery or the proof of crossing symmetry. There's an analytic path that connects two different amplitudes. The amplitude for particles to scatter, with another amplitude that involves antiparticles. So it's a truly deep result, okay? I think, so we all know and love the CPT theorem that connects particle and antiparticle. This is deeper, okay? This connects also by exchanging one particle at a time, or two particles at a time. And um, I will come back to, 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 to this work later. This one? Is it fun? Yes, it is. It is. And I don't know if this is the thing you're pointing to, but I remember you proved various things about Landau's speculations about how things scaled. Perfect. That's that's what it is about. And uh, in his own, in, the, in the thesis, the PhD thesis, he, he discovered the topology of the space of solution of Landau equations, where the singularities and perturbation theories are. And this was under the uh, uh, was a student of Stora. So Stra is not typically known for the work on S-metrics. It's one of the heroes of gauge theories or mathematical physics. Um, however, so when I'm preparing this talk, I read various uh, papers and conference proceedings by Bros. And Bros was saying that Stra was actually the godfather of this group. He said he was the one that he went to Berkeley at the beginning of the 60s. And coming back, he brought these new ideas from Berkeley about the S-metrics, even though he was working on QFT. It was actually giving momentum to, to, this, uh, to this group of people. Is that trip? Some are here? Yes, so, th and what work was done in 68? Uh, okay, I'm not sure about the, so I didn't know about this uh, acronym, this way of referring to this work. Uh, the one I know and I used in my own research was this classification of kinematic singularities of scattering amplitude. So these, of course, are Gilles Contenugi, Navle and Morel. And um, so, you know, amplitudes have all sorts of singularities. We are used to think about them, uh, the fact that you have uh, are dynamical singularities where particles are produced on shell and uh, the amplitude factorizes. We, uh, we, knew, we, we use all this thing very often to do actually do calculations. But there are, there are other singularities in when you have particles with spin, which are related um, 
the fact that the licity themselves may not be uh, well defined, certain climatic configuration, or because you have a selection rules from angular momentum conservations. And this uh, um, classification basically will show you all sorts of singularities that must appear in order to satisfy all these selection rules. Uh, this is uh, perhaps easy, very easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This was Isik. So Isik also is not usually associated to S metrics, but he had a paper in '69, which I I, I, uh, I found it very interesting. is about uh, uh, scattering in QED at very high energies. He had uh, um, a new technique to try to uh, calculate. Uh, uh, what happened at very extreme high energy at, at small momentum transfer, and it invented the, um, the relativistic version of the corner scattering that was known in relativistic mechanics. It basically brought it to uh, relativity, and he also used a very modern method at the time uh, to, to Schwinger. This paper has a little bit of a little bit of issues, but more or less is correct, and and uh, well, is correct. Let me say, well, okay, maybe maybe I should say is correct. Although um, the regime of validity of the calculation is not what uh, Isikson thought it was. Right? It's smaller. It's basically an expansion when uh, alpha electromagnetic over V is very large. And this happens when you have a large nuclei with a large Z number. And this technique is actually useful today for doing calculation in, in, in uh, gravity, actually. So people use a similar, te uh, similar technique to do uh, uh, semi-classical calculations. In gravity, where the, in the case, the analog of alpha will be, be large, is uh, that you're doing trans scattering. You have a big mass, like an uh, astronomical object, and you can uh, calculate the scattering against an astronomical object, a large input parameter, using the same technique that Itzikson uh, was using in QED. This one, another one who is uh, present here. Sorry? It's present here, so maybe he's not allowed to say it. <laughs> <laughs> to add another rule. So it's Daniel uh, Jagonitzer, who in 73 introduced a famous uh, uh, transform called the FBI transform, which is a cool name, and uh, uh, with uh, a long term collaborator of the Institute, Fourier. And uh, and we bros, and and this uh, transform uh, happened to find uh, a lot of applications in pure mathematics. Okay, for example, in uh, micro local analysis, and it also plays a role in the in studying the analytic properties of scattering amplitude with with several variables. So as I said, um, many things happened during the 80s, 90s, and so on. And so the, the field became a little bit dormant until uh, the rival, oh, sorry, I forgot one. I forgot one. And there is a reason because, it, so who, who is this person? Omnes, very good, yeah, this. Omnes was <coughs> definitely working on this matrix. And uh, uh, I couldn't pin down a specific work. I mean, I found some works here and there, but didn't look too important now. So I didn't want to mention that, but uh, he was definitely very active on the subject. He has all schools, all conference proceedings. He's one of the people. And also there's the letters by Bross referring to Omnis as you know, very important for his own research. So definitely uh, something, someone that should be mentioned here. So as I said, there was a little bit of a phase transition during the great success of traditional quantum field theory and string theory and uh, phenomenology and standard <laughs> model, experimental success also. <coughs> and um, the IPHT rediscovered a sort of interest in uh, scattering amplitude and S-metrics in a different way with the arrival of the Institute of uh, David Kosover in 92. I think this really brought a new fresh air uh, uh, here, completely different perspective on the topic was about actually doing calculation in, uh, in gauge theories, in QCD, because we care about experiment uh, at uh, colliders, so we want to do predictions compared against backgrounds. And, uh, and um, it pushed you know, the level of uh, 
techniques to, to, to really to the extreme. And uh, this uh, uh, has created a lot of, uh, um, a lot of new developments uh, worldwide. So it was really, really a turning point, I think, for the, uh, for the life of the lab. Also a few years later, also very important for the life of the lab was the arrival of Pierre Vanov <coughs> in 2000, who had the different angles on scattering amplitudes that David still uh, perhaps with imperturbative calculations, but much more related to string theory. Okay, that was uh, calcul calculating amplitudes within string theory and within effective field theories. Okay, with the also modern uh, approach to the subject. So in 2009, it was the arrival of uh, Ruth Brito and uh, Denisha Korczewski. Ruth, of course, is super well known for her work on, BC on BCFW. And uh, Denisha, of course, is not strictly speaking, I would say just uh, someone working on just scattering amplitudes, works on everything, he knows about everything. So definitely knows about uh, scattering amplitudes. Uh, every time I you know, happen to discuss with him, he knows more than I expected, so I felt to mentioning here. I arrived 10 years ago, exactly, by the way. I started in October 2013 here. And uh, my own research was uh, not about scattering amplitudes at the beginning, although uh, I was interested in the effective theories. And I discovered over the years that this work done in the 60s and 70s uh, um, was providing some methods that were able to tell us about the structure of effective field theories what we could or may discover in the future uh, are colliders or in uh, other effective theories, for example, for gravity. It was Carrasco in 2015. They unfortunately, it didn't uh, uh, stay very long. And uh, <coughs> I also want to mention this year, of course, we have the arrival of Matt uh, Von Ippel, who uh, amazingly discovered that that picture was fun. So actually, congratulations. Um, I didn't know until I, I searched for and for a few days on the internet. Also, when I mentioned, because there are many other people that uh, went through the lab, uh, postdocs, uh, students, and I want to mention just three here. So there is uh, um, um, uh, Alexander Ocher, I think, was a student at Root, and now is, of course, one of the experts using amplitude to calculate uh, uh, gravitational uh, wave signals for LIGO. Is uh, Piotr uh, there? Piotr Kin, who's a student of Pierre. He's also uh, produced very interesting work on scattering amplitudes uh, recently. And, and my student Julia uh, Isabella, who, who just uh, graduated, and uh, she's working on, on UCLA on scattering amplitudes. Okay. Now, since we're physicists, we should care about data, even though we are theoretical physicists. Sometimes also. Um, uh, we may forget. Uh, you see, for example, Frasar, the bulk of his citations come from the last 10 years. This is his famous paper about uh, Frasar Baum. He had the citations, that the bulk of them comes from the last 10 years. I think it's pretty amazing. It means that the, the citation distribution is flat. Once it's integrated, it gets this, uh, this linear. It typically is not like this. Typically, the distribution is not quite flat. It's actually you know, it's raising, and then falling, and forgot. OK? That's, uh, even more amazing, I think, is the case of Bros, together with uh, Epstein and uh, here the Abus Rivetta, Yashes, and, and Glazer Assern. So you see, this is a fundamental paper, I think, has only 95 citations, which is a pity. I think it should have 1,000 more. And it has the flat distribution. So basically, the distribution citation was uh, decaying, it was just collected. And then it has a huge peak in the last three years. OK, so it seems very important these days. So what's happening? Let's look who is citing him. So you see there is a, are the best people in the world working on scattering amplitudes is citing him. You see there is Simon Karohuot, so absolute superstar, my personal hero. So he's basically citing twice here in a row uh, uh, Jacques Bros in a paper about uh, extending crossing symmetry. This was the proof of crossing symmetry with four particles. They are trying to extend this for n particles and uh, use it for prediction at LIGO, so completely different physics, gravitational physics. You see, that's the beauty of physics, by the way. So think about uh, particles, a colliders happen to be important for LIGO gravitational waves. 
And you see you know, amazing people here, Mizera, uh, McLeod, Schwartz, Vergu, uh, Miguel Paulos, if I hate, Baltimore Ries, Joao Peredones, and so on and so forth. So really, the best people in the field, yeah, I am almost, I'm basically done, I guess, um, found the work of Bross 60 years later, still very important. And that's typically the mark of good work, and everything. If I, if I can take two more minutes, I just uh, want to say that, for example, this is another example. This is a work by Fun. This paper, again, by McLeod, uh, Hoffi, uh, Matthew Schwartz, Christian Vergo, so very exp expert in perturbative amplitude calculations. This, uh, wrote this paper here, and the word Fun, uh, yeah, I guess you cannot read it here, is, is mentioned 71 times. But this is a paper from, from, from last year. I also want to mention this work by Brossier Gollnitzer about uh, the FBI transform. He said that to be uh, in this, this is a paper by Simone Karohot, Mizera, and Offi. And they said they were studying end to M uh, scattering, the crossing property. They say that uh, basically nothing is known about it except the two to three scattering by Bross again. And uh, local analytic properties which are accessible thanks to, to the transform, the FBI transform by Bross uh, and the uh, Yogonets. OK, um, I think I am over time. And uh, I was supposed to talk by my connection, my own work, to this amazing group of people. But I will spare you this. I have to say you that, uh, well, to, to, th to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bando. We have time for a few short questions, maybe. I have a comment. Uh, Christian Vergou was also a PhD student here. Did ah, you know really? that? Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, even we take it also. Even, ah. He was in my fifth year class. Okay. So great, great students. Huh? Another question or comment? Mm -hmm. And by the way, there are amazing postdocs uh, today is in this lab. Huh? I think uh, there are many present uh, working on scattering amplitudes. Okay, then maybe we can just uh, thank Bondo again for this yes. very nice talk.